Hi, I'm Paul from Physics High. Lasers. Now these are quite ubiquitous. That is, you can find them fairly cheaply these days, and you can use them to do all matter of things, such as pointed things, such as at my wedding ring. Lasers are quite common in industry and medical devices. They're used, for example, in eye surgery. They're used in industrial applications. And of course, every time you go to the supermarket and get your grocery scanned, they use lasers. But what makes a laser a laser? Let's turn the light off and examine the laser by using this deodorant spray. So what you notice is three things. First of all, it's monochromatic. That is, it only produces one color. Secondly, we have a beam that is coherent. That is, the waves that are coming out are all in phase with one another. And thirdly, we have what we call a collimated beam. That is, a very nice focused beam. But why is it monochromatic? Why is it coherent? And why is it collimated? And what does laser actually stand for? Well, today I'm going to discuss the working principles behind a laser, so stay tuned. Now, laser stands for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. Now, we're going to explore that, what that means, but we also want to address why it is monochromatic, coherent, and of course, collimated. So to start off with, we need to have a look at the structure of the atom, which is really about the substance that actually generates the photons that we want to have for the laser. Now, we have here the Bohr model of the atom, and I have a video that you can have a look at where I explore the Bohr model. Now, it is a simplistic model, uh, and needless to say that the atom is far more complex where there actually some probability clouds around the nucleus. But in this case, this model will suffice to help us understand what's going on because the electrons do exist in what we call discrete orbits. They don't radiate energy in these orbits, and so they have various energy levels. And so my electron can exist in one energy level, it can exist in the other energy level, and there could be more further up. Each case, it is a, a step up in terms of its energy, but they are discrete energy levels or quantum energy levels. That means that the energy between one energy level and the other one is a very discrete amount. And this is where we're going to have an excitation going on here. So I will have a photon coming in, and if and only if that photon's energy is exactly equal to the difference between these two energy levels, that photon is absorbed by my electron, and as a result, my electron jumps an energy level, and so has a higher energy state. And then what happens almost immediately is that an electron jumps back to the lower energy level, what we refer to as the ground state. And so it drops down and therefore releases energy. But guess what? It releases the energy with exactly the same photon of energy being released. So that is under the principle of what we refer to as E is equal to HF where F is the frequency of my photon, H is Planck's constant, and E, of course, is the energy. Now, that explains to us why it is monochromatic. As we'll see as we go on, all the photons we're going to be talking about are exactly the amount of energy that we are dealing here with their energy levels, and so therefore, we will only produce photons of a very specific amount of energy, and hence, it's monochromatic. Let's move on. And let's look now a bit closer because we've talked about emission. And in this case, we've got spontaneous emission, photon coming in, electron getting excited, dropping back down, and then spontaneously emitting the same photon energy. But we want stimulated. And so what we could have is a situation like so. We have my electron here, and it, of course, is stimulated by my photon. Comes in, of course, my electron that is absorbing that energy, jumps an energy level. Now, what if now, for example, while this electron is in this stimulated stage, what happens if it encounters another photon? And in this case, it absorbed that energy, but before it drops down, or whilst it drops down into its energy level, it now releases two photons. And so what we get here is an increase of photons. And so what we have here is an amplification. I started with one photon and end up with two photons. So in that sense, that explains the amplification process, though there's more to it, as you'll see. But the thing is, is that the second photon is exactly the same. So in other words, it is the same wavelength, the same phase, same everything. So we say it's coherent because they are in phase with each other. Now, why they are actually going to be exactly the same is actually a quantum phenomenon that I'm not going to delve into now. And that could be something that you can look into further. But needless to say, we have now a duplication of our photon. And so 
that explains why it's coherent, because they are always going to be in phase. Every photon we're going to be producing will have exactly the same frequency and phase as a result. So I can have a photon going in and a single photon going out, which is spontaneous emission. I can have a photon going in, and if the electron is already in a stimulated stage, I can have two come out, and so now I've got stimulated emission. So what happens if now if those two photons encounter other stimulated electrons? Well, we start off with two, of course, then we got four, we have eight, then we have 16, and of course that continues on. And so what we get this is cascade effect of all these photons being generated as long as they encounter stimulated electrons. But here is the problem. The time it takes for the photon to start in its excited state to back to ground state is very, very quick. So what is the probability that we have multiple atoms in their excited state? Well, really, really small. So small, in fact, that really this is not going to produce our cascading effect. And there's a problem right there, at least in the simplistic model. So we need to find a way of increasing the population of our excited state. And so what we get now is what we call population inversion. Let me explain what that means. So in this case, my population is in its ground state. Now I've got here six representative electrons in their ground state. And so the number of electrons in the excited state is going to be definitely different to the number of electrons in the ground state. So clearly our N2 is less than N1. If we want to have a continuing cascading effect, we need that to be reversed. We need more in the N2 state than the N1 state. And so what we want is what we refer to as a population inversion because the population is inverted. We've got more in the excited state and less in the ground state. So how do we get them up there? Remember, as I said to you, that when they're actually pushed up there, they very quickly jump back. So even if we actually have a few stimulated before we have anyone encountering another electron, very quickly you'll find they will be jumping back down to their ground state. And as a result, the number n ends up being mostly in the ground state. So how do we solve that problem? Well, the solve the problem is by introducing a material that you can actually have a third level or a level three material. And so what we want to do is stimulate our electron beyond to the level that we want. And how do we do that? Well, we have here our second, we're a second and now a third level. So imagine I fire a white light photon. Now you're gonna say, hold on, a white light photon doesn't exist, you are correct. Actually what we have is, let's say light, that has basically white, so it has multiple photon wavelengths in there. And hopefully one of those photons, of course, will excite it up to this level right here. And so now what we have is our super excited electron, but the materials chosen here that these two energy levels, or well, this energy levels is very, very unstable. And so what happens is as I pump the white light in, we have our electrons jumping up into this third level here, but very, very quickly it jumps down into this second level. And so what we now get is an electron that is in the second level that will stay there a little longer. Now this state here is referred to as the metastate. And the beauty about the metastate is that the time that the electron exists in the metastate is actually a little longer, up to a thousand times longer than, let's say, in the normal situation. And so what that means is you're going to now get a situation where you're going to have a lot more electrons sitting in this metastate for a certain period of time, which means if I now have my photon coming in and it's ex experiencing an electron in that meta state, very quickly what we're going to get is that electron jumping down and we now will produce two photons. It's more probabilistic for us to produce more photons that way. So in essence, what we get is this. So here is multitude atoms, and what we start to see in these electrons, and start to see in these atoms, we start to see pairs of photons coming off as they come out. And then, of course, they're interacting with other atoms as well. And then what you're going to get, of course, is an increasing or a cascading number of photons being generated in your material. But you can see a problem is that they're all going in different directions. We're not going to get, let's say, a strong 
focused beam. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is with our atom, as I said to you, is we need to apply some sort of energy source. Now, it can be a light source, but it can also be an electrical source as well. So this is what the stimulation aspect. So in this case, we're using light. And so there's our light aspect. We've talked already about the fact that it's amplified, and we've already talked about that it's by stimulated emission. So we've actually covered most of the terms already of the term laser. But what we want to do is increase the effect. So how do we do that? Now, the first thing we do is we add mirrors. What does that do? Well, we have, of course, photons going all different directions. But any photon that is going in, let's say, that direction is going to reflect back and go back in that direction. And then, of course, when it gets to the other side, it's going to reflect back in that direction and so forth. It's going to go backwards and forwards. And every single time you start to see a stimulated emission, you're getting more and more photons as it goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. In essence, if we then look at the light in terms of its wave phenomena, what we end up setting up is a standing wave. It's actually what we call a resonance. And so what we get here is a huge amplification as we get to generate a standing wave of photons basically going backwards and forwards every single time increasing exponentially as they encounter electrons. Now at this stage we've got it in a tube with two mirrors but the beauty here of course is, is that along this path it's very no, anything that goes in the other direction will be bouncing off the mirror and goes up out to the side, but we're going to definitely get an increasing effect along the line here perpendicular to our mirrors. Now, being a standing wave is that that standing wave is determined by the wave formula, which is F is equal to NV over 2L, where N is basically equal to the different harmonics. In this case, I've got a harmonic of two, the reality is, is that the harmonic we ge generate here is in the thousands. The frequency, of course, is the frequency of the photon, and the V, of course, is the speed of light, and the length is the length of the tube. So in other words, if you set the length of the tube right, you'll create the right resonance for the wavelength that you're interested in. And in this case, for example, a red wavelength, let's say 632.8 nanometers, which is the wavelength for a helium neon laser. So now that we have set up a standing wave, we need to now somehow let the light out. Well. I need to change the transparency of my mirror. Now, by changing the transparency of my mirror, usually only about about 1%, so in other words, it's now 99% reflective, I'm going to get my some of my light going out and I have my laser beam. Because the light now is only what is going perpendicular to my mirror along that line, that central line, it now explains why we get a really tight beam and it is collimated. And in some uh, uh, lasers, what they might also do is put a small lens to really uh, adjust for any imperfections that may exist. So in summary, let's quickly review. What did we use to pump the energy into our tube? We used light. What did we end up getting? We ended up getting more photons, so we had amplification. How did we do that? Well, we had to have emission, but it had to occur with electrons that were already stimulated, so we had stimulated emission. And as a result, we get a nice monochromatic, coherent, collimated beam, which we can call radiation. Well, I hope that has helped you understand how a laser works. Please like, share and subscribe and put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you. And consider supporting me via Patreon. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.